Hi, this is Mike Paulson with another Bible study video presentation of the risen Savior Jesus Christ from a King James 1611 Bible only, teaching the simplicity that is in Christ by presenting Paul's greater commission during this dispensation of the grace of God, emphasizing the goodness of God by rightly dividing the word of truth in the King James 1611 Bible and according to the Apostle Paul only. Now, for those of you that are new, I would ask that you would uh, pause and read the scriptures that support what I just introduced myself as doing. But for the sake of time, we're just going to keep moving right along. So unpause it when you're done reading them. And I hope that you're not just a lazy enough Christian that you wouldn't check these things out. It's so important to read the scriptures and not just listen to people. Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God on them which fell severity, that's the Jews, but toward thee, the Gentile nation, singular, goodness. If thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou also shalt be cut off. And he's talking about the Gentile nation being cut off, not individual Christians losing their salvation. Oh, my, the things that come across from pastors today. And then also a short story in, in uh, Corinthians 12, 31, it says that Paul is showing us a more excellent way. Not a better way, but just more excellent. There's there's more involved here, and it's, he said, it's a more excellent way. And then the, the real good story is in Acts uh, 18, verse 25 and 26, uh, uh, story of Apollos, and here's this Apollos guy. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom with, when Aquila and Priscilla, or Aquila, who knows, and Priscilla had heard, they took him unto them and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. We learn in the Gospels that Jesus taught the way of God to the Jews. It's the way of God to the Jews. That's all they knew, and it's all they know, and that's still all they know, because Paul comes along, and Paul teaches the way of God more perfectly, meaning finished, completed, it's done. So there's more than the Jews ever knew when he when Christ went to the Gentiles. So moving along here, we are looking at part two. Is there such a creature as a carnal Christian? And I, I'm doing this because uh, either the people that read this thing or followed along here the other day when I first put out, put out part one, that was in studious detail. And I could tell by the, the few people that wrote to me and said, I'm nuts. I could tell they never listened to it. They never studied through it. They caught the gist of it. One of their, one of their institute buddies or somebody out there told them, well, that's just hyper stuff. That's just wrong. He's looking to Paul. He's wrong. Done. Over complete. And that's what happens. People get these preconceived notions. They don't know me by now, but I have a feeling a lot of people don't read in detail or listen in detail to what I'm showing here. If you did, you would see that it isn't me. It's the scriptures that are being proven rightly divided. So anyway, part two is just a short attempt that maybe I can just summarize this whole thing and people can get it. Okay. So is there such a creature as a carnal Christian? Part two. Or, like I, like I always say, it's just another example of profane and vain babblings from today's evil, seducing, deceived, and deceiving pastors who, with their good words and fair speeches about another Jesus, have truly robbed this world of the inspired and preserved words of God that teach the goodness of God, as well as a true salvation with this risen, living, and holy Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what I did show in part one was that, uh, carnal, you're lost. You're dead in sin. That's, that's what carnal is. And Christian is one who is saved, quickened, made alive, not born again. I won't get into that in this one, but that is not what makes a Christian today. Now, my point was when a Christian does carnal things, we have to learn from Paul and in Romans and in Colossians, it isn't him doing them. So if the it's the sin that dwelleth within. I'll show you here in a second. So when a Christian does carnal things, it isn't him doing those carnal things. So there can be no such thing as a labeled carnal Christian. You really just have a Christian doing carnal things. So if you've got a Christian doing carnal things, doesn't that make him a carnal Christian? 
No. And I'll show you why. I'll show you why the pastors make such a big deal about it. You have a Christian doing carnal things. This is the battle we should be fighting, and it's within ourselves. Now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. That's Paul talking in Romans chapter 7. Absolutely fantastic chapter 15 to 25. Just a couple verses here. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Okay, so if you're doing car if you're doing carnal things, it isn't you doing those carnal things. It's that sin that dwelleth in me, because we're cut away from that. Colossians chapter two. Oh, I can Hebrews chapter four tells us what the word of God does. It's the sword of the spirit, Ephesians chapter six. And so uh you've got you've got to grab it and understand Romans chapter six, seven, eight. Read that every night before you go to bed, or read it when you get up in the morning, or read it when whenever you want. Just read six, seven, and eight. That is an absolute bottom line doctrine that gets you through everything that Paul's teaching to us. It's fantastic stuff. Now, Paul knew, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? So Paul fought the battle. Was Paul a carnal Christian? No, but Paul did carnal things. But it wasn't Paul doing those things. It was a sin that dwelleth in him. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with a mind, I myself serve the law of God. We know what we should do, but with the flesh, the law of sin. And by the way, where he says, a mind, I myself serve the law of God. It isn't the law as taught in Leviticus and, and Numbers and Deuteronomy and, and the Gospels. Okay, don't, don't let that trick, don't let that trick you. But with the flesh, the law of sin, because it's the sin that's in us doing that stuff. So no, there's no such thing as a carnal Christian. But pastors love to make a big thing of it. Today's pastor will call a call people a carnal Christian if they are doing something worldly or, most important to them, going against what that pastor is preaching. Because, see, pastors preach a lot of things today that it's okay to do when scripturally and morally— it isn't okay. There are some people trying to do the right thing, and the pastor says, hey, it's okay, you can do that. Music, perversions, all, all sorts of stuff. So they call it doing something in the flesh. You're listening to the music in the flesh. You're listening to the Beatles, that's my age. You're doing it in the flesh. You're going to certain stores. You're doing it in the flesh. That's that's bogus. That is not what doing, that's not what in the flesh means. And I won't I get into that. In the flesh is you're not circumcised with the spiritual operation. Da, 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 da. Okay, so they don't get it. They really don't get it. So because they say you're doing something in the flesh that makes you a carnal Christian, and then they put this at you during the invitation or the sermon or the prayer, don't you just love those preaching prayers? Listen, been there, done that. Okay, so I know I know of what I am speaking of. So they'll put this on you during those invitations. Your heart is not right with God. Anybody remember Rex Harrison? Your heart is not right with God. He would sing that song, and the whole altar would be full of people crying and all sorts of stuff here. Confession is needed to bring back your close relationship with God, because after all, God left you when you started doing those things in the flesh. Which, by the way, is why born again is so wrong, because born again just basically means you get to start over. But now you have Jesus that'll give you the power to do the right thing and the unction and the anointing and so when you do you blow it then you gotta go back and you gotta get your heart right with god you gotta make some confessions because god has left you well does god mean does that mean you lost your salvation because if it does then you need to get born again again and if you're one of those that says you need to get baptized after you've been born again then i suppose after you've been born again again you need to get baptized again and again and it seems like they should put a baptism uh, tank right there by the invitation so people can jump in and get out again every Sunday morning or Sunday night for the serious people. Then the pastors will say, well, you might not even be saved. And then they will say, number four here, your own faith is not real, nor is it enough. Oh, you're getting scared now, see? Severity of God threat there. And now the newest craze is to worship God so he will forgive you and fill your life with blessings as signs and wonders and miracles to prove that your pastor and church is correct. Amazing stuff. So 
carnal Christian, no such thing. But the pastors know how to use it incorrectly. So if you remember this page from part one, I just said we're just going to concentrate on this one slide and then we'll be done with it. All the well-known authors, pastors of huge congregations in Texas and uh, Missouri, I mean, all these, all these big guys and their books uh, they, and their deceived followers, they, they disagree with me as they teach their good words and fair speeches. So somebody's telling you what's wrong with me and my teachings here and what's wrong with Paul and the King James Bible. They got a, they got a passel of good words and fair speeches to explain to people. And people are so deceived. Oh, pastor, you got it. You know, actually, no, they don't got it. And in truth, they're speaking profane and vain babblings. And I'll show you some statements below. My question through all these all these statements under here are, who decides if those changed lives have changed properly? Or have they changed enough? Who makes that call? The pastor, the parent, the Sunday school teacher, the youth pastor? And according to what teaching, against, according to what law, according to what doctrine, gospel law, Peter, James, Jude, how about Peter, James, and John in their sailboat, you know, remember that song, Beatitudes, that seems to be the standard to get people to try to follow the Beatitudes, but if you look at my sermon on the Beatitudes, there are at least five things in the Beatitudes that are impossible for us to do today, not possible. Ten Commandments, but they were only given to the Jews. So why pull them up today? Or Paul's manner of life as our ensample to the Gentiles. That's what we're to follow. However, I have noticed more and more some of these quickened Paul-following Christians tend to turn Paul's teachings into the law. So if you don't do some of those things, you're still a carnal Christian. They, they don't understand they just like Paul's doctrine, and they like the good stuff. They like the goodness of God, but they have not sat down and studied Romans. Here we go, 6, 7, 8, Colossians chapter 2, 11 to the end of the chapter, Ephesians chapter 1, uh, 12 and 13. Oh, there's so many wonderful things in that King James Bible. So here's here are some of the statements I've heard, you'll, you've heard. I read them the other day in a, in a thing written by a, a pastor, but what's wrong with Easy believism and and uh, lordship stuff. It's just crazy. True faith in Christ will always lead to a changed life. Okay, if not, then you must not have a true faith. Okay, well, first of all, true faith in Christ will always lead to a changed life. Who makes that decision whether you should change something or not, and if you change it good enough? Simple question. That should open the eyes of some people. And then you must not have a true faith. And the faith that's being talked about in the churches today is growing their own faith. They have no, they have no idea what it says in Galatians that uh, uh, we live by the faith of Jesus Christ. We live by his faith. We don't live by our faith. Our faith comes and goes. Okay, simple stuff here. Number two, we are saved by the power of God for the purpose of God. That purpose includes the works that give evidence of our conversion true. I, I won't argue with that. Paul even says in Acts 26, doing works meet for repentance. If we truly are saved, got to throw that in there just to make the pastors happy. They won't get this far in this particular presentation anyway. But if we are doing the right thing, then we then uh, as a Christian, we should, that's that's the purpose we have for us. Okay, so that's a good one of the many purposes. Okay, that's true. But then they go on and they say, those who continue to walk, there it is, according to the flesh, are not believers. Well, I'll tell you, if you're still in the flesh, you are not a believer. You are not a Christian. Romans chapter 8, verses 8 and 9, tells you what it means to be a, according to the flesh. If you're according to the flesh, you do not have the Spirit of God. That simple. So according to the flesh is not a walk criticism. Okay, anyway, uh, with true salvation, number three, with true salvation comes genuine repentance and real life change. Okay, same question. Says who? And how do they learn of those needful changes in their lives? By that anointing, the unction, obedience to the pastor? I mean, seriously, if somebody has to, has to 
you know, make a repentance and make a change. And if they don't read scriptures, which pastors don't teach them, how do they know what changes need to be made? And I can think of a few people right here locally that they have no idea that what they're doing is wrong based on the scriptures because they never read the scriptures. Apparently, God hasn't told them yet. They use the word uh, convicted, but the scriptures use the word convince. Christ has to convince us things because we read our Bible. We get convinced. Okay, let's move it along here. Number of what we do here, three and four here. We are to die to ourselves as we change into the likeness of Christ. Boy, show me the scriptures on that thing. Because their Bibles, all these modern Bibles say that these people need to imitate God. It does. Imitate Christ, imitate Jesus, imit even says imitate your even imitate Paul, but they don't talk about that one. Uh, and you're supposed to even imitate the faith of your pastor. Seriously, yes. And I, I just always like to ask people, say, so you're you're uh, you're a certain church thing. So how are you doing it imitating Christ? Are you being, you know, be like Christ, that kind of stuff? And there it says they're changed into the likeness of Christ. That is an amazing antichrist. That is an amazing statement to make. That's just an antichrist. You think you're living like Christ? You're, you're an amazing person because uh, you are a liar to the max. Okay, number five is amazing. We have been forgiven by God, but that doesn't mean we never have to confess our sin. Oh, really? Well, what, what sin is there to confess? I read in Romans 6, 7, 8, we are dead to sin and even dead to the law. I read in Corinthians, our sinful works will burn in the judgment seat of Christ. But me, myself, and I, I'm still clean. God's righteousness is imputed to me. All things are become new, Paul says. All things are, be I'm still new. I'm still clean. So this is one of those guilt-tripping uh, invitations that pastors are good at. You've been forgiven of God, so you need to still make sure that all your sins are confessed. And I remember a long time ago thinking, well, if I'm completely forgiven and Jesus paid it all, like my bumper sticker says I bought from Florida there, what do I, what do I have to confess and why? Well, then they throw this at you, number seven. We are positionally righteous, but practically sinful. Boy, now there is a guilt statement right there to put on people. You're positionally righteous. You are a Christian. But you know, you've done some sinful things this week, you carnal Christian, you. You better get it right with God. Just more profane and vain babbling of good words and fair speeches from these guys. Cute, though. Positionally righteous, but practically sinful. They say, God forbid that you would continue sinning in Romans chapter 6. Okay, verses 1 and 2. No, the King James Bible says we are dead to sin, noun. That's sinning. The pressure is to stop sinning from the Gospels. And Paul's teaching is we're dead to sin. Christ took care of sin. And if we do something wrong carnally, it's not us doing it. It's the sin that's still in us because he cut us away. Absolutely fantastic stuff to get a hold of. And I'm telling you right now, the churches out there, including, I'll give you the alphabet, like, I'll give you the letters because I don't want to say their name, P B. I, they have no clue. They're picking and choosing, rightly dividing. And so they're still teaching profane and vain babblings. Okay, verse eight, we did our question eight. We did that one here. And nine, we must crucify our flesh or our salvation is false. False, Or if we don't crucify our flesh, the relationship with God is over. Yes, we are to try to crucify our flesh. That's, that's the battle we have. We read that in the opening slide. But nothing is at stake when we fail. We're not to grieve the Spirit of God. We're not to quench the Spirit of God. But we do. And, but there's no punishment for it. It's just as it will burn in the judgment seat of Christ. We build with good works while our bad works will burn. And that's Paul's biggest message. He is the he is our wise master builder. If you, out there in your daily walk, following his manner of life, trying to anyway, as his him being our end sample, then if we do some good things, we'll build up. But when we mess up, well, he burns it away. And the gospel crowd, the church crowd, you better not do anything wrong or your building will come tumbling down. It's amazing. Today, we have no instant judgment or severity of God at this time. 
It's amazing, isn't it? Romans 7, 15 to 25. Note that God keeps us from evil, by the way, by us reading our rightly divided King James Bible, uh, not going by our feelings or any supposed anointing or unctionating, because that stuff's not true. God keeps us from evil. He will let you drive your car off the cliff. He will let you get a job you shouldn't have gotten. He will let you get married when you shouldn't. He'll even let you go out there and, and uh, do things you ought not be doing. That means you got to get married later. He'll let you. But if you read your scriptures and try to follow that stuff, you won't. But then the sin that dwelleth in us will, will try to make that stuff happen. And uh, that's the battle we have right there. But God will keep us from evil if we keep our minds and eyes in that King James Bible. Okay. So these things are not true. And I like this sign. That stuff, poisonous gas, poison gas. Now, the only way, and I, I can see this, the only way they can come up with these kind of statements these pastors saying these things, and they say them all over. And people believe this stuff too, by the way. They do not rightly divide. They mix all the books, especially tribulation books, Hebrews to Jude. And they say all scripture is given by inspiration of God. All scripture there, Paulson, and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, for correction, for instruction, and right. That's true. However, the, the Bible is divided dispensation, not chronologically, but dispensationally. And so people pull out something from the Old Testament or from, you know, I always tell people, are you building your boat? Because that was written to Noah. How about the Ten Commandments? How about how about the law? Why aren't you doing that? Well, that's not, yes, you're right. It's not written to us. You look to Paul for the scripture that is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction. And right. We look to Paul for that stuff. They look all over the place. They pick and choose. That's what they're doing, picking and choosing. And we just go to Paul only. Working on a sermon, by the way, a presentation of how much they hate the word only. Okay, number B or letter B here. In order to do these statements, they have to teach scriptures to Gentiles that were directed to Jews only. Three or C, and they have to mix modern Bibles that change words, which change complete doctrines. They use Greek definitions that are really not all of them are true. And if you don't know all your Greek, you don't know what you're talking about when you go back to a Greek word, even if your pastor does it for you. And they change literally thousands of King James Bible words. D, let the words of pastors become your final authority in all matters of faith and practice instead of one single historically proven, doctrinally sound, inspired, preserved, and that which is perfect Bible that is not just contains the word of God. There's a typo. That King James Bible doesn't contain the Word of God. It is the Word of God. E, completely ignore and reject the goodness of God while they continue to threaten the severity of God. This is why they come up with these statements. They're just, nobody, I've never heard anybody on YouTube, anybody who sends me uh, videos I'm supposed to watch about a pastor that's teaching some interesting stuff and some good stuff, even the Paul guys. They never have talked about the goodness of God. And that's what leads people to repentance today. Not to fear the severity of God. Not the coming tribulation. Oh, the tribulation. Uh, you know, not the past. Not the, oh, the goodness of God. F, they follow apostolic doctrine, which especially go to Peter and James. Those statements I, I, wrote, I read to you a minute ago, a couple of those, they had to go to the book of James to make their point. Well, James, verse 1, tells you who that's written to. to Mamie. They just, it's amazing, they do not use Paul. If they do, they might pick and choose a few verses out of it, maybe, you know, Corinthians or something, but uh, they don't, they just despise Paul, they follow apostolic doctrine, because after all, that's what it says in Acts chapter 2. They just, so why is Paul in your Bible, people? Okay, uh, G, continue trying to build their own kingdom of heaven, physical kingdom, Locally and internetly. That's their church. Trying to build their own cute little kingdom here. You know, they want you to buy gold, for example, but uh, they want you to give them the cash. And they're telling you, well, here, you get the gold and I'll take all your cash. Well, if it's not going to be that big a deal, why do you want my cash? That's amazing stuff out there. And then lastly, they build their local church on Acts chapter 2. And they ignore Paul's church teachings in Ephesians chapter 4 and 5. That's what they have to do to make come up with those crazy statements that we just read earlier. And they throw carnal, carnal Christian at you. And we've learned, hopefully, that you can no such thing as a carnal Christian. Christian doing carnal things. But we've got the judgment seat of Christ to take care of it. 
Uh, we've got the operation made without hands to take care of it. It's amazing. We are dead to sin. We are dead to the law. And all things are become new. That makes it impossible for us to ever be a carnal Christian or to fear having our salvation judged based on our day-to-day -day walk or our works or a manner of life when we make those bad choices. It isn't us doing those things. It's a Christian doing carnal things, but that does not make us a carnal Christian. I hope you can get that. The judgment seat of Christ will sort out our, our good and bad works. We ourselves are already saved, cleansed, made alive. We are even kept clean. We can't even get dirty. And as I said, it's a rough battle, though, Romans chapter 7, 15 to 25. Read that a few times, but that's part of reading Romans 6 through 8. So uh, you have a great time reading. It is all made possible because of the risen Christ and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God that does the spiritual operation. And that's the King James Bible. I keep trying to get somebody somewhere to realize this simple and most wonderful fact. This is all taught only by Paul from his books, Romans to Philemon, and is found only in the King James 1611 Bible, written for and given to the Gentiles during this dispensation of the grace of God. And people have a hard time with 1611, but 1 Corinthians 13, 8 to 10 has to be what I say it is. It has to be the Bible. It can't be anything else. And I got sermons on that, but let's not get into that. People today, and you know who they are, don't seem to care about the coming severity of God. Can't even talk to him about it. They just poo-poo it. Well, they haven't seen it in their lives, so they don't believe that severity of God. They don't believe in, they don't even believe the goodness of God is real because they've never heard about it. Their pastors don't ever talk about it. Even Paul pastors don't talk about it. They don't realize truth is becoming a lie, Isaiah, that good is becoming evil and light is becoming darkness. They are just caught up in it like everybody else out there. They no longer even care about their modern Bible, any Bible. They just want to hear those spoken words from their favorite religious leader or author or pastor who scratch their itching ears while they practice their satanic rock and roll in church, if they go to church, as they are being deceivingly prepared to worship Satan as the Most High, all being eternally damned with him. So my final question, after, if, you, if, you get a, if you get a grip on this stuff in Romans 6, 7, 8, and on, uh, you know, you're a carnal Christian, there's no such a thing, but Christian doing carnal things, and you see, you see all these things, you're dead to sin, dead to the law, of what Christ did to us and for us, it's just beyond understanding, beyond, I shouldn't say beyond understanding, because the more you read, the more you learn, the more you understand. It's just amazing that he, so why did he do that? Is it because he just loves us, like everybody likes to say? No, look at Romans 10, 11 and 19. Through their fall, uh, Jews, salvation has come unto the Gentiles. Why? To provoke them to jealousy. Them as the Gentiles? No. The Jews. The Jews, he's doing this to, this is crazy. He's doing this to us and with us to show his people what they could have had. And you, you can't give us any more than, than God has given to us through the risen Savior and through Paul and tells us about it in the King James Bible. 19, but I say, did not Israel know? First Moses saith, I will provoke you to jealousy by them, that's us, that are no people, and by a foolish nation, that's us, Gentile nation, not America, a, a Gentile nation, I will anger you. Isn't that amazing? Moses even said that. Why would anyone want what the churches are teaching today while rejecting Paul's ministry of the goodness of God to the Gentiles? Well, I know why the pastors aren't teaching them. If you give me an hour in a pulpit in the same church and they all follow the same Bible, I can show them what, what's going on. But I, I just, if a person's really questioned, why would you want what your pastor's teaching? Why would you want the severity of God and not what Paul is teaching from the risen Savior? People say they're Christians. I say, well, why aren't, you, why aren't you following the teachings of the risen Savior? You believe that he died and rose again? Sure do. Well, why aren't you following what he wrote after he, or what he spoke after he died and rose again? Well, pastor knows what he's doing. Your pastor doesn't know anything. So why would anybody want what the churches are teaching today? Well, like Moses said, 
he knew they would respond with anger. I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people and by a foolish nation. I will anger you. And people today, they are responding just like Moses said they would with anger because they're being taught Jewish teachings and they're all getting angry over this stuff. So now if you are new, I would suggest I would ask you to pause this particular page. And if you're not new, then uh, and you've been through this page before, well, then I guess you can turn it off because we're done. But uh, again, if you're, if you're new to this whole presentation thing of mine, uh, put this all stuff in front of you here and uh, pause and read it. This will inform you of what's going on on my presentations. There you go. The end, hopefully the beginning for some folks somewhere.